Hello everyone, welcome back to the Bucket Think Tank for Comics of the Week, and today we're going to dive right in with Aquaman issue 39. So, while Mera is getting ready to attend to matters of state, that now, she's, now that she's queen, Arthur and Merc are currently trying to, you know, keep an eye out for potential threats to Atlantis. Now that it's on the surface, you know, before, it was, we already had issues before with America staging um, a fake attack on on Arthur to sort of provoke a war, but that was really done with the president's knowledge, but it was done by an organization named Nemo. So Arthur is a bit wary to exactly what may happen here because even if like the the top the top heads of, of America don't want to do anything, there's still groups that will and will still operate without, you know, going through anyone. Hence the Suicide Squad that we talked about last issue. So speaking of which, the Suicide Squad is sort of really coming to the realization as to exactly what they've got here. And according to Lord Satanus, because, you know, we'll probably never see him again, which is why he has a stupid name. It's a magical nuke, which doesn't make anyone feel better, especially Master Jailer and even the recent Atlantean defactor Ursel, who, especially with Deadshot here, is sort of like, look, I'm all for, you know, killing people and you know what not that's part of the job but you know nuking nuking atlantis it won't just sink it'll kill everyone around here including the children i'm not doing that and it just sort of leads to the group sort of splintering off but luckily aquaman along with his group dolphin on dean and jirok are there to apprehend the suicide squad which leads to a really low-key fight you know croc is there master jailer lord satan is dead shot and you know and Harley, and they're able to apprehend Master Jailer and Harley while the other ones get away to, you know, do their nuke thing. And everything seems to be going relatively well for Arthur. You know, we've got two, and they'll help us find the others. But this is where Mara finds out exactly what's been going on. And she confronts Arthur because she hasn't seen Arthur in days, in ages. And, you know, he wasn't at her coronation, so she's been feeling a certain way. She's been worried about him. And to find out that he's just been here making decisions behind her back, she feels a bit a bit hurt. And Arthur is sort of saying, well, I had, I didn't want you to, you know, reveal to be, you know, put under suspicion for this, you know, be complacent. This way you had total deniability if because you didn't know. And we all see that Arthur really is blaming himself for this because Atlantis coming to the surface was pretty much because Arthur subconsciously wished that Atlantis was on the surface. That would make things better, at least for him, if Atlantis was on the surface and wasn't hiding, you know, it would make things a lot better. And he's sort of really laying this burden on himself, which I think is something Arthur's just so used to doing, he doesn't realize that he's shutting people out and whatnot. Maybe he'll also cut his hair again, I don't know, I don't know. So... Arthur wants to use King Shark and his gang to help apprehend the Suicide Squad because, well, the U.S. will have total deniability and if something goes wrong or if, you know, Atlantis retaliates against this, they'll be labeled as the aggressors because this is a Suicide Squad. It doesn't really exist. The whole point of Suicide Squad is we send a bunch of criminals out there to, you know, do our government bidding and if, hey, if they're caught, we just say they're criminals and we're done with it and in case it really gets bad, they've got nukes in their brains. So, at first, Mary doesn't want to do that, but then she finds out that, you know, they're carrying a nuke and, like, fine, send King Shark, we're going to get our own Black Ops team of just undesirables, and we're going to apprehend them with that. So, Aquaman 39, it's alright, it's alright. I mean, when you, whenever you find out that, a, that there's a story going on that has to cross with another story, you should expect maybe a bit more. Like, Night of the Monster Men, I felt was really good. And even Just League vs. Suicide Squad was able to keep your attention a bit better th than this one. This sort of feels like we didn't really need a tie-in issue. We could have just said, like, hey, the Suicide Squad is going through with the mission. We could have actually dealt with that in the Aquaman book. So I don't know why we had to put it in the Suicide Squad. Arthur seems very, everything is my fault. And I'm going to make it seem that I'm humble, but it's really just sort of my ego coming in. But it also is still his fault that, you know, Atlantis is on the surface, and the, sort of the real question is, what's going to happen between him and Mera? Mera definitely wants Arthur by her side, but Arthur seems sort of very set that he's an old relic and that, you know, Atlantis doesn't need him there. It would only cause more problems, like, oh, you know, Arthur's whispering in her ear, Arthur's the real power. He, he doesn't want that, you know, to be, to be burdening down her rule as queen. But at the same time, Mary's like, look, I don't care. I love you, Arthur. And, you know, we may not have the life we wanted, but this is the best we can get. And I want you 
with me through thick and thin. That's sort of the real sweet moments of this book. And I don't know. I don't know. Um, I'm still looking forward to seeing how this plays out. Will Atlantis sink in this in this whole story, or will it remain on the surface? We don't know. We don't know. The jury is still out. And speaking of juries, Batman issue 53. Now, this one, we've been sort of uh, going back and forth with how this story has been going. You know, issue 51, I felt, was really, really great. And issue 52 was sort of... Uh, 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 uh. But here is the resolution. So, if you recall last issue, Bruce was about to give, like, the best evidence he can to say that, you know, Batman isn't infallible, that, you know, Batman could have made a mistake. And he starts off by questioning one of the jurors. Her name is Missy, and he brings the fact, like, I see you have a cross. And do you believe in God? She says, yeah, I believe in God. I go to my church for 20 years. And Bruce says, like, you know, I, I used to believe in God. And, of course, by default, when someone like Bruce Wayne says he used to believe in God, we all know what made him not believe in God, which was the death of his parents. And he was sort of looking for a sense of meaning, and then he went off to training, looking for something to believe in. And as he tells the story, he came to Gotham, and he found Batman, which is a really clever way of saying, uh, you know, I became Batman when I came to Gotham. I found the idea of Batman, whereas opposed to what everyone else is hearing is, I was in Gotham, and I saw Batman. That was it. And... Bruce sort of says, like, you know, that's what you've all found, too. You found transcendence in Batman. But in a lot of ways, Batman is God, if you choose to define God as an infallible and irresponsible being who determines life and death. That's what, is what we would attribute to God to some extent. The people of Gotham have let Batman be the perfect being and how they treat how they treat his will as their own law. He goes on to the story of Job, you know, posing the question, God asks Job, when Job posed a question like, why are, you, why are you burning my farm and killing my children? God posed a question like, who are you to question God? And at the same extent, who are we to question Batman? And he goes into the fact that, you know, he, he gets a bit personal talking about how he was hurt recently. And before that, Batman was his everything and protected him from pain. But he was hurt again, you know, referring to Catwoman dumping him. And, you know, Batman was nowhere. And technically, Batman was, to some extent, the cause Bruce lays the case that Batman cannot be God because Batman cannot provide solace from pain, hope for the eternal, or comfort, or comfort you for lost love. And, th and then it sort of goes back into Twelve Angry Man a bit more with Bruce making the appeal that their decision has to be beyond a reasonable doubt. And since Batman isn't God, he can't he can make mistakes, and it is clear. That he has, if you step back and look at this, you know, the issue with the coroner's report, the fact that even Mr. Freeze said something was off with Batman, and he seemed a bit distracted, and it wasn't very much like him. So something was going on, and that he did make a mistake. And that the best thing for us, if we do love Batman, if we think he is the best hope of the city, we have to hold him accountable when he makes these mistakes. We have to let him know, we have to set him free of this, by saying, we know you're not perfect. And we know that this isn't right. And so they make the vote and they go a la 12 angry men. Bruce is able to convince them to side with him. And it turns out Bruce bribed his way onto a jury, which had to be like the weirdest story ever. Like, dude, this billionaire just bribed me to be on a jury. I don't know. I don't know. But it's on the jury. Yeah, I don't know. And he doesn't quite know where he feels right now. And he doesn't want to wear his costume anymore. Well, not the costume he wore when he... When he met Catwoman. He doesn't want to wear the costume. He instead puts on his original costume. One of his older costumes. You know with the trunks. And says like I want to go back to remembering. Who I am as Batman. And it goes to a little quote about Job. How he shaved his head. And you know sort of rebranded himself. Sort of you know. Try to get back to who he was. And that's how the comic ends. And Batman issue 53. Has to be. It's one of Tom King's weirder ones. I think Tom King always has great ideas. And I said before that I think he's very set on writing a Bruce Wayne story. As opposed to a Batman story. I think that's something we kind of have to work with. It doesn't mean we have to like everything that's been happening. This issue has been... It's very personal. I was trying to wonder how Bruce was able to, you know, not make people think he's Batman. And it almost felt like some people were thinking, Is he Batman? He sounds like he's Batman. He's way too invested in this to be Batman. But it was also nice just to see the impact Batman has had on just the people of Gotham. Like, the fact that Bruce was able to look at all the other jurors and say, okay, who here has been saved by Batman? And everyone raised their hand. Batman has saved all their lives. 
you know, if Batman was in court, he probably would have had the jury just like, I mean, we can't have this jury. What? Batman saved all of them. We can't do that. I think that was like a case in, in the She-Hulk book where Jennifer Walsh has helped save the, save the planet. And the, the, the defense is able to get the case thrown out because, well, Jennifer Walters saved the planet. The jury is going to side with her whether she's right or not because she just saved their lives. So no, throw it out, throw it out. And that was interesting. And especially here because, again, like I said before, the weirdest thing about this is that the biggest critic of Batman here was Bruce Wayne. And I think that's actually pretty normal. I think anyone would really sort of look to... I think we should always look to Bruce Wayne to be the biggest critic of Batman. And it was even more to see how he personalizes Batman. That Batman isn't just a way for him to deal with, you know, the pain of his parents' death. It's to deal with just about anything. Like, if he's got a problem, he dresses up as Batman. And the the loss of Catwoman, you know, Catwoman leaving him at the altar, quote-unquote, was something that Batman couldn't protect him from. It was actually the cause of it. Remember, Selina didn't want to... The reason Selina didn't marry Batman, or Bruce, was because... She didn't think that Batman could be Batman without being sad, without being miserable. And in her mind, I guess it was she'd rather have him be miserable than dead. Because that was something in the annual that, you know, Catwoman was apparently always trying to make Batman better, which was like really, really stupid in my opinion. But whatever, this was a really fun issue. I like how we explained why he's got the trunks back, why he's got this old suit back on. You know, Superman did it, and his logic, the logic for that one, why Superman had the old costume on, was he gave his, the one he usually wears to Lois while she went off in space. That made perfect sense. This one is Batman's like going through some stuff, and he needs to get back to him. He needs to get back to who I used to be. Yeah. And, you know, coming to terms with all that reminds me a lot of Just League Issue 6, which is, well, the planet Umbrax, the energy from it is proving too strong. And it is set to turn Earth into a living, evil planet. So my response is, well, shouldn't we call Mogo to just sort of rough this, you know, other planet up here? I think that would have been the best way possible. But for all intents and purposes, Cyborg and John don't know what to do. Meanwhile, Lex and Joker are closer to getting a hold of the totality, but Batman is able to, you know, break back into Lex's ship courtesy of the kryptonite that he brought in Superman's body because, of course, he brought kryptonite with him into Superman's body. Even Lex is like, really? You brought kryptonite into your best friend's body? I, I, don't, I don't understand you. And, you know, those two sort of engage. At, meanwhile, at the Legion of Doom's underwater base... Flash tries to appeal to Grodd, while Black Manta and Cheetah get what they wanted, which seems to be the means to kill Diane and Arthur. Told you they wouldn't get their own little moments in the sun. Actually, throughout most of it's just Joker sort of watching everything that's happening. You know, Joker himself tries to use the Marsh's body to help Lex by getting all tentacly and going into Superman's eyes, which was really, really gross. But luckily, Hawkgirl comes through courtesy of Batman saying, Hawkgirl, you're there, and she's able to knock Joker out. But Joker, but Lex is able to get a hold of the doorknob, of the cosmic doorknob, which is what I'm going to call it, and he's able to just sort of rough Batman up, literally like, breaks like both his legs and I think one of his arms, and he's able to teleport uh, Batman, Superman, and Martian Manhunter, and either back to the Hall of Justice, I don't know why he sent him to the Hall of Justice, that's how confident Lex is that he can't fail, Look, just put, them all, put all the heroes together, nothing they can do. And for a while, they don't quite know what to do. And John's like, well, if, the, if you know, Cyborg wasn't putting this in force field over me, I probably wouldn't be able to hold back the, the ultraviolet spectrum. But Cyborg was like, I haven't put a force field over you. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm busy trying to deal with, you know, this world-ending thing here and keeping the Hall of Justice safe. And that's when John realized, wait, what if we're going about this the wrong way? What if coming to terms with this what if you know instead of trying to resist his powers we use them we're able to fix things off and he sort of realized that he's sort of come to terms slowly with what happened on Zhangxi. and so that's when they realized okay so if jean can use his telepathic powers to connect with the people i can then get to them and show them how to use the ultraviolet light so jean breaks him from sinatra's control i help them fight it off and we should be good but to do that we're gonna need Something fast, something fast. Flash's car. The, the car he made like two issues ago. Okay, and that, for that to work, Barry has to sort of tap into the still force. So the world's fastest man has to not move, which is 
sage mode all over again, which there is a sage's force. That, that is, God bless Flash War. So Superman throws the Flash car, tapping into the, the speed force and the still force. And what's really sweet about this is that we're seeing a lot of our characters sort of coming to terms with a lot of things. You know, John sort of comes face to face with his own demons, which were the people of Zanchi, and he just sort of apologizes to the image of them. Martian Manhunter is sort of allows himself to show the more vulnerable and sort of darker aspects of himself, namely the loss of his people, which he's sort of been carrying on his own. And, you know, Barry, you know, having to slow down is just sort of interesting in itself. And as Lex is about to touch the totality, it changes color as Hawk goes, goes upside his head with the mace. And instead of being the ultraviolet light, it turns to the white, the white element of life. And the planet has now been changed as the comic ends. Justice League issue six had to be, I never quite know what I'm going to see with this. And Snyder... Like, I, I think I'd have to, I think I really do want to revisit Snyder's Batman run and see if there's anything I can pick up here other than he loves the Joker. And he's, he's made a good use of just about every character here except Wonder Woman and Aquaman and Cheetah and Black Man. And I think just because there's too much going on here, that's sort of been the problem with these huge team books, or rather like the Just League the Avengers. There's always like one or two characters, like we've got nothing really to super contribute to this. So, um, yeah, we're just going to sit you this one out but you know it's still not over yet so we don't quite know what's going to happen it's interesting that black man and cheetah have this sort of weird items to just deal with their enemies and maybe we'll see them in their own books you know kelly pseudoconics taking over um aquaman and i forget who's taking over wonder woman soon but maybe we'll see these things play up or maybe we'll see them in justice league we don't quite know yet overall this was a really fun issue i love exploring the emotional spectrum more that you know, the ultraviolet light is sort of built by, you know, grief and shame and, you know, the personal issues. And I kind of want this to be, I, I'm hoping this doesn't go away because even John said, even when Sinestro says, like, you know, you'll never be a Green Lantern again, this might be the new thing for him. You know, like he and Sinestro may be fighting over the ultraviolet light and exactly what that means, we don't know. But we do know that most of those people who are, you know, part of this army are going to no longer be part of this army soon. We all know that. But with that in mind, we'll bring, this, we'll bring this original. We're going to bring this video to close here. If you're new to the bucket, thank you. Feel free to like, comment, share, and subscribe. Check out some other videos if you're interested. It really helps the channel, and I will catch you all later. This is the Bucket Think Tank signing off. May your fandom serve you well.